Good morning, and welcome to Little Rock Original Free Will Baptist Church. I'm Jerry Godwin, and we will be sharing the lesson with you this morning from um, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. And if you'll go to Judges and then to Ruth that we talked about last Sunday, the next uh, book is 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. So I'll give you time to find that. And the title of the lesson is Hannah and Eli. Uh, this section we've talked about conversations. If you remember, the first one was, was between uh, Naomi and Ruth. Last Sunday was between Ruth and Boaz. And today is a couple of conversations. Um, but when, mainly with Hannah and the priest Eli. And as we go, go to the Lord in prayer, um, remember those on your hearts. And, and as we pray, um, intercede for these people and, and these situations. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we... <clears throat> Come this morning with thanksgiving that you are have joined us in this Sunday school lesson and that you are aware of our needs even before we mention them because you care for us and you love love us. We praise you, O oh God, for because you are worthy of our praise and, and no one else. And Lord, we lift up these prayers right now as the, the listeners are mentioning those situations and those people um, that they care deeply about. Hear these prayers, O oh Lord, and and minister to these situations. Help us to be aware of your presence in all the situations of life. We thank you, Lord, that the COVID situation seems to be getting, getting better, um, but still there are those that, that we know that have COVID. And so we pr still continue to pray Help us to be faithful to you and our faith, Lord, in you through these trying times. Lord, I thank you for this privilege uh, and the opportunity to teach once again. May your name and, and your name only be glorified in Jesus Christ. Amen. We are... The, the lesson begins in verse 9 uh, of 1 Samuel chapter 1. But in so many situations, I want to go back to actually to verse 5 of chapter 1. And this is where um, Elkanah, the man's name is Elkanah, and he had a wife named, named Hannah um, who was not able to have children or had not had a child uh, at this time. But he also had a, another wife whose name was Penina. And um, she was quite fertile. And she would, um, was having children. But every year they would go to Shiloh and offer sacrifices. It was probably a peace offering because um, the families that presented the sacrifice were able to eat the food from the sacrifice. And every year... They would go, Hannah and Elkanah and Penina, and 
Hannah was, could not have a child. And it was a very disturbing time for her. And she would weep. Now, we've talked about this before, about we all have cried. We've all gotten emotional, um, even, even from a good movie. But usually when we weep, it's because of people we love or situations that are very disturbing to us. And we pray from our, from our toes to our heads. And as babies weep and get, get the stempers, we have cried and, and had the stempers. And I, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think Hannah was in that situation because she wanted a child so much. And when they did the sacrifice, she wouldn't eat. Now, this is a bonus. This is not going to cost you any extra money. But I, I just wanted to share this because you have to think about it from a man's point of view. And for you women out there, don't try to think like a man. <laughs> it's pretty much impossible. But as uh, Hannah was weeping, Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? <laughs> why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Do, listen to this. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Well, here's my words of advice. Because I was a sinner for so many years in the early years of my, my, our marriage. And, and for you that don't know me, I was always in a financial, statistical, data, and analysis field. And my quantitative skills are pretty mu much off the chart. But this is the mistake that I made for many years. And I want to save you, if you haven't started, to save you from making the same mistake. When my wife would be upset, I would say the same things. Honey, why are you crying? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm going, thinking to myself, what do you mean you don't know? Um, and and um, you're at dinner, and you're like, why don't you eat? I'm not hungry. <laughs> and, and, you, you, and, and you say, well, well, let me help you fix the situation. This is it. Ding, ding, ding. Listen. They do not want you to fix the situation. From my background and skills, I wanted to fix it, and then everything would be okay. They do not want you to fix the situation. They want you to listen. Listen to their problems. They have an issue. Look at them and listen and hug them and tell, you, tell them you love them. Don't tell, tell them, aren't I worth more than ten sons? Am I not the best? Oh, look around you. Am I not the best husband that all these women have? Yes. No. They do not want your uh, suggestion. Okay. That's free. That's the end of the lesson. But um, it was so funny to me. I find humor in the Bible because I can see myself. Well... Why did Hannah want a baby so much? Well, first of all, it was considered a disgrace if a woman did not give her husband a son. 
Now we go to um, not so long ago when Henry VIII, King Henry VIII was around and he had six wives and he wanted an heir to his throne and wives one through six, none of them could give him a son. He annulled two marriages and he beheaded um, two wives. Um, I don't think this fixed the problem. And strangely enough, it could have been Henry VIII's problem was the reason that he couldn't father a child. And this is the same here, is that the Bible does not, makes no possibility or awareness of, of male infertility. It could have been Elkanah, although um, Penina had several sons. And like I said, this went on for years. And also, they assumed that God is the one that made them infertile. And also the Bible tells about these infertilities. If you remember Sarai and um, Rachel for Jacob's wife, because the outcome is going to be even greater. And we're going to see that in this story. Now it says that they had eaten and drunk a at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And remember, this was Shiloh, and the Ark of the Covenant was there. And I got just got to say, because I gotta, 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 is that my name is Eli. My name is Jerry Eli, and I'm proud of my name. But Eli don't turn out to be such a, a, a smart person in this story, uh, and I can relate to that. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly, and we talked about that. And then she made this vow. Now let me tell you, folks, uh, here's another thing. Do not <laughs> make a vow to God unless you're planning on keeping it. There was a story one time of a man that was on an airplane and he was sitting next, next to a preacher and there was a tremendous electrical storm and the plane was being tossed about and people were getting sick and... The, the man said, he was a very businessman, was a very wealthy man. And he told the preacher, he said, I vow if I get down uh, out of this safely, I will give God half of what I own. And so they went a while longer and finally they landed safely at the airport. And the preacher said, sir, I want to remind you of your vow. He said, well, preacher, actually I had a second vow that I told God that if he ever caught me on an airplane again, I would give him 100%. <laughs> so he, he reneged on his vow. And, but here's a vow that um, Hannah is making. She said, O Lord of hosts, Yahweh, if only you will look on the misery of your servant. God, look on me. I am miserable. My life is miserable. And remember me. Don't just look at me, but take my wishes to the throne. And do not forget your servant. But give to your servant a male child. Now, many of you out there have had 
difficulties having babies when you wanted them. Others of you were quite successful early on. But my wife and I went through some several years of not having a child, and, and I can tell you how dis disturbing it is. And one of the most painful days of the year is Mother's Day in a church when you can't have a baby. I remember my wife holding a child. She loves babies, and I love babies. And she would hold someone's child, and in a church, someone will invariably come up and say, oh, that looks so natural. Why don't you and Jerry have one? Or isn't it about time for you to have one? You've been married for four or five years. Don't, don't say those things. I'm giving you a lot of information here on things that we shouldn't do. Don't say to a, someone and you don't know their situation. And the Boolean logic here is, God, if you would do this for me, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. Now, a Nazarite could have, you, you can be a Nazarite for a relatively short period of time, but here Nana is crying out terribly weeping and saying, God, if you will do this and I remember me and I will have a son, I will dedicate him to you as a Nazarite. And that meant that he would never have a haircut, that he would not drink any intoxicating beverages, um, including the fruit or the seed of grapes, and that he would not touch um, a dead person, and that he would commit his life to them. Now, you may or may not know it, but a couple of Nazarites um, in the Bible were Samson. Remember, he didn't cut his hair, but remember that Delilah had his hair cut and he had broken his promise. And then there was John the Baptist. That was a Nazarite. And remember in the New Testament talking about how, how he looked. And then we have um, Samuel. Now, Elkanah loved Hannah. She was his first wife. And he wanted to make her happy. And thus the conversation that he had. He was just doing it because he loved her. But if he had loved her enough, and it had been a different time, perhaps in this time of history, around 3,000 years ago, um, he wouldn't have had the idea of actually listening to his wife as we do today. Well, here's another <clears throat> problem. Is the second wife, Penina, loved when they went every year to, to Shiloh to offer the peace offering, she would get in Hannah's sandbox and she would say I've got a child I've got a son we've got several sons well, you don't have a son you don't have an heir to his fortune you don't have you don't you don't you don't have you don't you don't you don't and how did this make her feel now here's a here's a question <laughs> we we all have paninas in our life, <laughs> either now or in the past. And I have to admit, in my, no, not in my past life, but sometimes I like to aggravate. <laughs> sometimes I like to be an irritant to my brother and sisters and mother and daddy and all my friends. I would apologize if it wasn't so much fun. <laughs> But I, 
When I do that, normally I don't do it when someone is hurting. I, I don't do that. Um, I only do it on a daily basis to get attention and to have a little fun. But here, here Panina was evil-spirited and want, wanted to bring um, sadness and distress to her, um, to Hannah. Now, Hannah goes to the sanctuary to pray, and Eli is there, and he's watching her as he prayed. Now, Leslie Weatherhead, some of you may know, he is more, most famous for writing a book that has been uh, a great resource for me over the years, entitled The Will of God. And The Will of God is basically the five sermons that he wrote um, during the terrible days of World War II. And it tells about the different wills of God. But he also wrote another book uh, entitled A Private House of Prayer. And I have put in my wish for that for Christmas. Well, he died in 1976, so there's no new copies, just old copies, paperback, and also some hard copies. And he says that there's seven rooms in the house of prayer. Room one is where we affirm the presence of God. We thank Him for His presence. And I ne you never hear me say, I thank you for that I can feel your presence. I always say, I thank you for my awareness that you are present. And it's room two is we praise, thank, and adore God. Room three is that we confess, for, ask for forgiveness, and unloading um, our emotions. Uh, room five is a place for desire and sincere petition. And as it says that most often, that's where we spend most of our time in prayer is for petitioning God. Room six is for the intercession of others. I thank God when people intercede on my behalf um, to, to God our Father and Jesus Christ. And we as the priesthood of believers, we, we understand and appreciate that we as Christians can pray interceding for others, and I would recommend doing that. Room seven, he calls the big room at the top of the house is set aside for meditation. And we really need to do more of that. And in and, and meditation, I think about separating myself from everything except just me and God and listening to him. And one time, myself and two other men from this church went with the pastor um, to, um, <laughs> I can't think of the place right now, um, down near the Noose River. And... <clears throat> It was training, and one of the things that they told us to do was to go to a place, and I sat on a rock, and to obey away from everybody else, just between you and God, 
and talk to God and listen to God. Listen. Listen to God. That's where we fail. That's where I fail so many times. As a matter of fact, Diane, you might be listening to this, my wife. That's where I fail in other times. Just like Elkanah did. I talk a lot more than I listen. <laughs> and I said it. I talk more than I listen because I'm an extrovert. I think out loud. And I can't hear. <laughs> but I'm going to be working on that soon. God wants us to listen to Him. And your spouse wants you to listen to them. Your children want you to listen to them. And listen to this. Listen to me. <laughs> listen to this. Not only verbal language, but nonverbal language. Your children and your wife, your spouse, can say a lot nonverbally. Um, someone said it, that um, at Colin Powell's funeral, that in a meeting they could hear his eyes roll. <laughs> he was sending a message. Now, she continued praying before the Lord, and Eli thought she was drunk because she was praying and her lips were moving. Well, some people do that. And you don't know what burden it is on somebody's heart. And he said, I can't believe that you're in the temple drunk. And she said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have not drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your child as a worthless woman. For I'm speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And Eli had to be embarrassed. And he said, go in peace. The Lord grant the petition that you have made to him. And she left and she was sad no more. And she and Elkanah went home. And she knew he knew his wife, which means he had a relationship to her. And they conceived a son, the great prophet Samuel. And she dedicated him as a Nazarite. Um, let me share this song with you <clears throat> related to Hannah, related to me. And I'm sure related to you. He touched me. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and all the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me Let me leave you with this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and, and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace.